the I can say about magnetic field has been said. So this is be very, very brief. Then we discuss the Higgs boson production through fluid fusion in a presence of an external magnetic field. For this, we will work for the tensorial structure associated with the process. And then we do the leading calculation with through Feynman diagrams. And at the end, I will present some plots to see the results and the final remarks of the talk. So the first brief insight, as we know, the Higgs field is responsible for generating the, the masses of all the elementary particles of the standard model. This is through the spontaneous image breaking of the electroweak symmetry. Then, since almost 10 years ago, we know that the particles indeed exist, characterizing the properties of this Higgs boson. It's a very important issue, it's a, and will help us to understand the nature of different processes like the spontaneous unity breaking, the Yukawa's coupling, among others. Then, for the theoretical side, we have very precise calculation of Higgs boson properties. For example, the decay and production modes by different channels. And it turns out that the principal channel of production is this one known as Coulomb fusion. It's up to the 87% of the production of, of Higgs boson. So, this, what I just told you, this investigation has been for proton-proton collision. This I call like the vacuum. But recent studies show that the possibility of produce and detect Higgs in another types of collision. For example, the relativistic heavy ion collision. This is as we discussed earlier, because at the initial stages of this, this type of collision, there's a lot of gluons. And being this channel, the gluon fusion, the principal channel of Higgs production, this is, this is an ideal situation to produce Higgs bosons. So, well, depending on the stage of the Higgs boson formation and decay, the effects of the environment creating this type of collision could affect its properties. That is like the presence of a magnetic field or the, pain, the temperature. So, basically in this talk, I will discuss how the presence of the electromagnetic fields in this type of collisions um, affect how one gluon see each other to create, a, at the end, a, a Higgs boson. So, for completeness, this is the, the profile we get in this type of collision that we know. This is a very intense uh, magnetic, field magnetic field intensities at the beginning and the decay exponential. So, wait, let's begin. So the process we are analyzing is two gluons in the, in the initial state and as a final state, a Higgs boson. Here is the associated amplitude that in the initial stages we have two gluons, momentum P1, P2, Lorentz index and polarization, and as a final state, we have a Higgs. Then, well, we know that there are no direct interaction between Higgs and, and gluons, so these processes come from relative correction. At, at leading order, we have two contribution that, that with, we have two, two Feynman diagrams for that. Okay, so this, this amplitude could be thin, could be represent an, an interaction for three, three particles. So schematically, we'll represent like this, this little thing, this little sketch. At the beginning stage, we have two gluons, that something happens in this blob, and at the end, we have a, a Higgs boson. So I will calculate this, this thing that I will call effective vertex. And, well, we have two gluons, two vector bosons, so this thing has two Lorentz index. And the two leading order diagrams are this one. The two gluons are in the initial states, and as a final state, we have a Higgs. And here, the presence of the electromagnetic field is represented by these double lines in the quarks. Well, this is a, a loop of quarks to, to go through the process. Okay, but before I started calculating, it's a very good question to, to see how this, this thing, this effective vertex look like. So, from difference of the vacuum case, the presence of these external magnetic fields generate a lot of structure that we can use to build our vertex. In vacuum case, we have the two momentums of the moments of the two gluons, and well, we can always help with the, with the metric, but we have these two, well, here, J refers to the two, the two momentum we have. But the, in the presence of this magnetic field, we have all of this contraction. This contraction, the momentum with the electromagnetic tensor associated with the magnetic field, this double contraction, and the contraction with the dual. 
So we have to take in care all of these structures to construct the most general, the most general uh, structure for for our vertex. And well, I think the the reference doesn't seem very good at here. It's a little cut, but you can ask me later if you want. Okay, but we are not uh, working directly with this form of, of the vectors. We are reorganized a little bit, just one of them. And it proves out that if we want a gluon with momentum, I said P1, the polarization vectors of this gluon can be described by the following basis. The first one is just the momentum, capital A is this contraction with the F, capital A star is the contraction with the with its dual, and this G is this double contraction with the F, certainly normalized, and then you add the first vector. There are an orthogonal basis, so, well, it satisfies the, the complete relation with, with the metric, no? Okay, so in terms of these two bases, we have two, one referred to the momentum P1, and the other referred to the momentum P2. We are going to write the most general things we have to, to our vertex. So, this is the most general thing we can write. As you can see, you just referred all the polarization vectors with momentum P1 to the Lorentz index mu and all with momentum P2 to nu because that's the, the index there they carry at the beginning. Okay, so this is the most general part. It's a very classical way to approximate, as you can see, well, to approach the, the problem. There's very nice paper that start to doing that. So we can reduce the form of the effective vertex applying some properties that <coughs> we must require. For example, we have to require the, the word identities because our vertex have to be tra transverse. The bosonics exchange because we are working with gluons and there are indistinguishable, we can switch each other. So switching P1 and P2 and mu and nu, the effective vertex have to look the same. And finally, it must be invariant under charge and parity transformation. So applying these three, three properties and working with gluons on shell, we found the following final form for our effective vertex. And as you can see, there are only three structures that survives, and the coefficients here have this notation. That is how they have to transform to parity and charge conjugation to, well, satisfy the all vertex, the parity and charge conjugate transformations. Okay, now, now we know the form, but at the beginning we are interested in calculate the, the cross-section. So now, with these forms in hand, how the cross-section will be calculated? But basically, the cross-section for this process is given for this expression. We have to calculate the m square model, then do a sum over the color and the spin of the gluons, of the initial gluons, and then do the integral over the the momentum of the produced particles. And, well, this M in matrix is related of, of, to our effective vertex as follows. It's just the contraction with the asymptotic states of the, of the gluons. So, performing this, we obtain that the cross-section in the presence of a magnetic field is just the sum or the square models of the, of the coefficient I just mentioned before, of this one. So if I found these coefficients, I just have to sum it all, and I just have the, the cross-section. Okay. So now we are going to calculate this diagram. These are the same diagrams that I picked, but I associated the dynamical values to follow the Feynman rules, uh, found the expression. And, ah, well, again, we know, well, I'm going to work with the proper time prescription for the magnetic field propagators of the quarks. This is the expression, well, <laughs> I think you see it like four to five times this week. And this is the, an expression for the Schwinger phase. In our calculation, we calculate the Schwinger phase for an, an, an arbitrary gauge. At the end, it doesn't matter for me, but we did it. And well, the non-invariant part, the invariant part of the propagator is, is this one. And this, again, is the Schwinger proper time. Here we have a, a little change notation before the, with the previous talk. Here I define this with a plus. The other talk is with a minus, but it's all the changes. And doing that, I'm following the final rules. 
we obtained these two expressions. That is very, very easy, very straightforward to follow. That is the vertex, one propagator, vertex, the other propagator, vertex, final propagator, and then we have to zoom over the all degrees of freedom we don't know. This is a functional trace, and for the Diagon Brie, it's exactly the same, but the order of these, the arguments of the propagator are in the opposite way, because the chart flux in the opposite way. So, a little more involved um, expression is the following, that I write down explicitly what is happening. And, as you can see, I have here the product of the three stringer phases associated with with each propagator. So, for this quantity is what is doesn't matter the gauge because this product uh, eliminate the gauge dependence because we have a closed loop of particles with the same charge. And well, as you can, and I said before, the order here is the reverse one. So the phase associated with diagram B is must be the opposite associated with diagram A. Okay, so this is in the configuration space. So now we want to go to the momentum space. For that, we are going to, to do this, this transformation. We, I'm dealing with neutral particles, with non-charged particles as asymptotic states. So I modulate this with flame waves and then zoom over the, the, so over the configuration space. So for this one, I'm going to generalize my expression to the dimensions, arbitrary. And then here, I said that the Schwinger, plays a, Schwinger phase plays an important role. Because if, if I hadn't the Schwinger phase, this is just, uh, this integration is just identifying delta Dirac conservation in each vertex. But now I have the Schwinger phase, so the integration over the perpendicular, uh, well, configuration space is not straightforward, it's not, it's not complicated to perform, but it's not just the conservation as, as, as before in the backing case. So again, after Doing this integration, we have an associated phase to each diagram, and it's again opposite. And now we have to carry out the integration over the, the quarks, the quark momentum. For that, we are not going to calculate first the spinorial trace, because, well, there are like three propagators and two extra gamma matrices, so we have terms that have 10 gamma matrices. So doing that gives us like hundreds of terms. So we decided to do this integration over Gaussian integrals with a shift, but without calculating explicitly the, 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 the trace. So that allows us to um, find expression. First of all, I don't do any approximation, so it's valid for any intensity of the magnetic field. It's very compact, compact in the sense that we don't have like the thousands of terms I just told you but not compact enough to fit in a slide. And it's, uh, well, I like it a lot, this expression, because you can see how term, well, which term becomes which, which part of the calculations. You can take the vacuum limit like a very easy way. You understand what, it, what part is it. And that allows us to, to see, to identify the possible problematic terms. And by problematic, I mean divergent terms. Okay, well, we, what next? So, for now, we have to calculate the integrals of the Schwinger proper parameters. We have three integrals left to do. Then we have to compute the spinorial trace. And finally, we're doing that is, well, the vertex doesn't look like, like I just told you at the beginning. So, to find this coefficient, we just have to project over the basis. And then if we did that, just summing these, these three ones, and we have the, the cross-section, the total cross-section. So, it turns out that, well, we know that the, these Schwinger parameters integrals are very hard to do for a, um, arbitrary field strength. So, in general, there are two types of approximation that we are doing, the weak magnetic field and the strong magnetic field. Here is a comparison with this quantity, that is the charge of the quark with the magnetic field intensity, with another uh, energy scale. In this case, is the, ma the mass of the quarks the inside the loop. So I will, I will work in a weak magnetic field approximation. I mean, I'm in this one. But it turns out that there are another uh, energy scales that matters to, to, 
<coughs> to the approximation. So what in general what it's what it did is okay, we have a weak magnetic field, so we can for, perform a Taylor expansion over the function that contains this QB. But as I told you, you found that there are remaining physical states, for example, the gluon momenta, that plays an important role that have to be considered. For example, this is a part of the expression I didn't show you that appears. This is the notation, this T2, which represents the tangent QB as the S3, S2, S1, blah, blah, blah. And as you can see, we have dependence of QB, but we have also dependence of the perpendicular momentum of the initial gluons. And we have no any restriction for how, how big or how, I don't know, they can value whatever you want. So if this is arbitrary big, we have no right to expand the full exponential as a Taylor, as a, well, yeah, in Taylor meaning. So I will use approximation that called with field approximation with low transverse momentum, sorry. That is mean that there are this one, these two are not so big. So yeah, I can, uh, not so big, I mean it's at least the order of the mass of the quark. So indeed I have took a, a Taylor ex, a expansion of all, of all the function that I have. So, okay, with this approximation in mind, we just have to zoom the, the two contribution of the diagrams. We expand it to the second order in the magnetic field and we project, we found the coefficient, and we do the, the, the sum of the square coefficients, and then we find the, the cross section. So this is the result I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna present to you. So this is the cross section as a function of the quark mass inside the loop. Now here is what, it's, what the Higgs mass is. And well, this is the vacuum case. This is the black one, and for the for this one, we have a magnetic field of point one of the vacuum case square, and these two lines are, are plotted for um, um, a head-to-head -head collision, so, well, a head-to-head -head fusion, where the Higgs boson is produced at rest. So we have the two fusion goes here, and the Higgs produced is at rest. This is because this cross-section in the presence of magnetic fields, it depends on the momentum of the gluon, so I have to, to <coughs> see how, how well, I have to determine the, its value. The vacuum case, it doesn't matter. It just depends on scalar things. So this is what I have. As you can see, the weak, well, we are working with a weak field approximation, so the curves are very, very near so, to the vacuum case. And here are two curves that I want to mention. The one that is in blue, that it is called phase. This is the full calculation that you just mentioned to you and no phase, well, we were interested in one way to see what the defect, the importance of the Schwinger phase. So I repeated all the calculation, but now consider that the initial propagators have no phase, just to see what's the difference between the two cases. And, ah, well, this is in orange because I didn't tell you and I don't, I don't want to forget what it is. This is the angle between the perpendicular momentum of the gluons as well. The magnetic field is in C direction, the perpendicular plane is x, 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 y plane. So we, have an, we can have an angle between the momentum of the gluons in those planes. So this is what this means. So as you can see, there is the, here will be the top quark, here will be the bottom quark, and all the light quarks will be over here. And well, the main contribution, as we know, this is a very well-known reproduce um, result, is over here, there's the main contribution. And you can see the two curves are uh, below the vacuum case. And here we have a, a mixture that we don't understand very well. So in order to understand better what is happening, we define the follow quantity that we call system response. That basically is compared the cross section with magnetic field, uh, subtracting the vacuum case and normalized with the vacuum. So for now on, we are only work with the top quark contribution because it's the, the most important, the most relevant contribution to the process. And okay, this is the first plot. This is the response system as a function of the magnetic field. This is for a uh, collision that is pure in the, <coughs> in the perpendicular plane. If the magnetic field is, is up here, the perpendicular plane is here, then the two gluons, then it's a head-to-head -head collision where the Higgs, again, is produced at rest. So 
Here we are investigating just what is the effect of the phase. And well, this is the full calculation, and this is the calculation with no phase. And as you can see, the effect of the magnetic field is to decrease the response system. This is negative, so this is meaning that the, the magnetic field decreases the cross section. And as you can see, the no phase is still negative, but above the phase thing. So in this case, the, the I, I forgot the word, the role of the, of the phase is go against the effect of the magnetic field. Does not change the tendency, the behavior of the curves are the same, but goes in the opposite way. So this has happened for all the curves that are going to present, so I'm not gonna show you this, this anymore, but it happens in all the curves. Then, ah, well, the past collisions, I, I just said that the gloom, that the boson, Higgs boson is produced at rest. So now we want to investigate again in the perpendicular plane, but that, that is not produced at rest. So we have three curves. This is at rest, exactly the same red one that before, but now we have two new curves that where the Higgs is produced with some perpendicular momenta. And as you can see, again negative, but now increasing. So you can see that the, the perpendicular momentum of the Higgs go against the effect again of the, of the magnetic field. Tends to increment a little the, the total cross section. Okay, then, well, we basically analyze how the collisions are only in the perpendicular plane, so now we, can, we want to be a little more general. For that, we analyze a, a little more general collision. This is, there are the two gluons, they're fused together, and then produce a Higgs. Then the first collision, well, the three collisions are exactly the same, have the same energy, the same momentum, all is the same. The only that is changing is the orientation to the magnetic field and to the perpendicular plane. So in this first configuration, I call perpendicular pure, perpendicular because the Higgs is produced in the perpendicular plane, and pure because the gluon lives only in the perpendicular plane. Then the next one I call perpendicular mixed. Now, because, well, the Higgs is also produced in the perpendicular plane, but now the gluons have mixed momentum, have some perpendicular momentum, but have some parallel momentum to the, to the magnetic field. And the last one is the parallel mix. Now, the Higgs boson is produced along the magnetic field, and again, the, the gluons have perpendicular and parallel momentum. So basically, if this is the, <coughs> the perpendicular plane, the first collision lives in here. The second, condi the, second, oh, the second fusion, the second process orientation is just a 90 degree rotation. And the third one is, uh, again, a 90 degree rotation, but in this direction. So this is the three, three orientation we, we want to compare to, to each other. So in this plot, these are the perpendicular mix. This one is the upper one and the perpendicular pure, the one that lives in, in, the, in the plane. And we can see that have a, a, different, a different behavior. Here, for the perpendicular pure case, that, that's the kind of uh, um, fusion process orientation that we are analyzing at the first, we can see that the effect of the magnetic fields go it's to decreasing the response of the system. And for this kind of orientation, it's going in the other sense. This is positive. Okay, and well, here again, it's I don't I didn't tell you what it is. Gamma is the angle between these two gluons in the general way, because gamma is the same for the all the collision, but the capital theta, the angle in the perpendicular plane changes of how of how these two gluons are are orientated. For example, here theta is equal to gamma, but here theta is equal to zero, because if you see that from above, the, the gluons go over there, so there are no angles. So it's not the same angle that, that's before. And well, then the other comparison, again, the perpendicular mix case with the parallel mix, where the Higgs is produced along the, the field direction. And as you can see, well, the blue curve, it's the same again. Uh, this is the same behavior as before. And you can see that along the magnetic field direction, there is a, a major, a greater suppression of the, of the production. So the cross-section is more reducing in that direction. Well, if the Higgs, 
if the gluons orientate in that way. So, as a final remarks, the first one is the polarization state basis that I call the Ritus basis. It is very useful to find the structure for general processes that involve vector bosons. Then, well, the methodology we use allows us to compute exact and compact analytical expression for uh, because we are we're not doing any approximation since the beginning because we are doing at the middle of the ones. Then the Schwinger phase plays an important role and in this case tends to reduce the effect of the magnetic field but does not change the behavior of, of the curves. And well, for head-to-head for -head gluon fusion fully containing the perpendicular plane, the presence of the magnetic field reduces the cross-section. Meanwhile, the perpendicular momentum go in the opposite way and well, as you can see, the orientation of the, of the process due to the magnetic field, it's, it's, it's important to the, to the processes in, in this type. And well, the Higgs production along the C-axis or along the, the B direction is reduced. Meanwhile, in the perpendicular plane is more involved because, I mean, I, I analyze this type of orientation and this, but I don't analyze all the way around that that the rotation. So I have to sum all of that to, to say that in, if in the particular place is also reduce or enhance the, the production. So that will very, that we offer me. And basically this is a, a cartoon dot what we are thinking. Thank you, a nice presentation. Actually, this is a nice picture which kind of goes with the question that I have. <laughs> when you have um, some hadron colliders which are producing uh, Higgs, uh, then in principle, all of this has been studied uh, carefully. I wonder if you have some sort of predictions regarding, I don't know, maybe uh, non-isotropic uh, production rates in somehow uh, in... Uh -huh event correlated uh, yeah. plane or something like this? I mean, at this level, I don't have it because, I mean, here what I'm, when, when I, what I analyze is the gluons orientation for, with respect to the magnetic field. But I don't analyze how much of these gluons are. I mean, we have another direction that I don't, well, I don't analyze yet that is this, the direction of the, of the beams, no? of, of the collision. So how much gluons are produced in which sense? Well, in that configuration, on the, or, or in this one, or in this one, we have to like, take the, the gluons distribution and zoom over because, well, I mean, I can, the, the possibility, the probability that like this occurs in this direction or in this direction, the same orientation with the magnetic field depends of where is the direction of the beams. So I, don't, I have to weight all the direction with the particle distribution function, with well, the particle distribution function, to know, like, for example, how if there are some enhancements in some direction, but to respect to the collision. But the thing that I can say is that the, in the interaction of the magnetic field, it reduces because in this picture, if I rotate it, I don't care. I don't care. They are the same. There are no changes in my parameters. So yes, in the B direction will be reduced. It's the only thing I, I could say. But all of the other directions is not. I don't. I can say neither at right now. But yeah, we are we are trying to do that. Well, this is the the next. Well, one of the next step of this research. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. So when, when you were doing this uh, general expansion that you have these eight parameters that you reduced to three, uh, oh. what do you think are the limitations of having these parameters not depending on, let's say, moment, no, not carrying any momentum, being a constant? Ah, you, for you, the... Yeah. For the general structure? Yeah, exactly. Like, what do uh. you think are the limitations, or what would you suspect uh, uh. the functional? I mean, this this depends of the momentum. Yeah, the structure. Yeah, but then a. Yeah, it depends also of the momentum. It, in, a, in a scalar way, because they are contracted, 
that would be not Lorentz index. But yeah, it depends on the momentum. Ah, OK. Yeah. OK. It has momentum so, dependence. Oh, OK. OK, so I'm going to ask later about it, more about okay. it. But I have another question. So I want to understand more about the, like the physical system itself. Because so you have, so you're studying this system where the initial, like you're, you're starting from gluon, but they are not supposed to be like a, a, an asymptotic uh, state, like the gluon, right? So if at the end of the day you are putting a black box, black box there between the gluons and the Higgs, why are you focusing on the gluon itself and don't you put a bigger black box? Yeah, I, I, and where I, you start with a yes. asymptotic state? Yeah, that I, makes sense. I could do that. I mean, yeah. if well, yeah, this is a, an approximation again. Uh, where I did that, uh, yeah, here. Like I, I, I told you that I manage these like a plane waves, but yes, I can. Think about it like the gluon is not like the asymptotic states, you know, that have interaction before we we have this this fusion. So yeah, we have well, it we correction to this. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's like uh, uh, what you see when is like like this, like two little bubbles like here. So this is more well correction that it must be smaller. Well, correction to this, to this, to this thing. Thank you. <laughs> More questions? <laughs> Everybody's hungry. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so we had we had a, a change in the timetable. So the name of. Uh, Vladimir Spokov is still there, but he couldn't come. Instead, Saul will give a talk in the afternoon. It will be the last talk uh, before the review uh, that Alejandro made. I 